We will now formally request Long Paul for a Dhamma talk. Brahma Shaloka Dipati Sahampati Katanjali'an Diwarang Ayacata Santi Dasata Paraja Kajatika Dese Tudama Anukam Pimampaja Namo Tassa Pakawato Arahato Samma Samputassa Namo Tassa Pakawato Arahato Samma Sambutassa Namo Tassa Pakawato Arahato Samma Sambutassa Putang Dhammang Sankang Namasami Peter, the sound is still okay? Very good. Thank you. So good evening again, or, or good morning. We have a few minutes to meditate together and uh, reflect on the Dhamma. And the idea of reflection is terribly important as opposed to belief. So the way Lompo Cha has taught me and Lompo Sumedho and others, they, they make suggestions from their own practice, their own readings, their own study of Dhamma, and they make suggestions to me, and I said, we'll try it out, see if it works. And that's, that's the capacity we have to reflect on someone's words or insights, as opposed to believing or disbelieving. So the question isn't to believe or disbelieve. Uh, the Buddha's teaching, it's more like, can you use it practically, pragmatically? Can it be a set of tools which liberate you from suffering? It's not, then it just it remains what we call a viewpoint, an opinion, a Buddhist opinion as opposed to uh, another kind of opinion. And opinions themselves are simply mental constructs. They don't really liberate your heart. You might have, you might have an opinion that uh, loving kindness is a worthy thing to develop and still be very angry. Right? You might have um, an opinion that... Uh, being uh, more simple in your life would be a good thing, but you might not be able to do it. So the idea of right understanding in Buddhism is to motivate you to actually do things, to think in certain ways, to act in certain ways, um, to live morally, to try to practice a, a life which is socially responsible and, and generous. Um, in the, throughout the teachings, you'll find uh, the word ditti, um, viewpoint, and sometimes it's associated with wisdom, so you have samaditi, right understanding, uh, and then you also have michaditi, wrong understanding. You also have, uh, say, ditti mana, which is the conceit of views, uh, ditu padana, attachment to views. So, uh, understanding how to use opinions and views correctly how to develop that as a tool for liberation is terribly important. When we, um, I've been reflecting, I often reflect on a very interesting piece in, in Lone Paul Liam's book, No Worries. So, so any of you who are not familiar with the uh, Thai force tradition, Lone Paul Liam is the abbot of Wapapong. He is one of Lone Paul Cha's foremost disciples. He's, I think he's in his early 80s now. And um, there's a small booklet of his called No Worries. And if you want to look that up, it would be on the internet. So you just Google No Worries and Liam, L-I-E-M, Lompa Liam, you'd find that. In that, there is a biography of his. And in that, he describes his own um, entry into enlightenment, how that took place and what that realization meant for his own uh, view of things. And I, I just looked it up. And there's one, one part of it which um, is, is really, I've always found an interesting statement on what the enlightened mind sees. 
Um, so I'll just go for the two, two periods. This experience continued on throughout the whole year, not just for a day or two. In fact, this has continued on unchanging for many years, all from that one go. There is the state of coolness, as if in the brain, whether sitting or lying down, coolness in every position. All worries, concerns, or similar thoughts from the thinking mind are totally gone. Thinking in this or that direction ceased. All quiet, just like a forest where there isn't the slightest sound of any bird singing. Truly quiet. No wind blowing at all. Just ongoing tranquility and peace. And this is, in this paragraph, is what I wanted to reflect on. It feels like there are no sankharas, no proliferations of the mind. All the suffering that arises with kilesas that had bothered me before, I don't know where they have disappeared. And this line here is what I wanted to reflect on. Seeing somebody, I just had the feeling of seeing it as absolutely normal. To see a person as simply a person, just that much. No beautiful persons, no ugly persons. Simply, people simply would be sp specifically the way they were. This is the kind of peace and tranquility that arose. I don't know what it was, but I also didn't care what it was, always knowing it is like this, by itself, in just this way. It is like this, through peacefulness and tranquility. There isn't anything to be concerned about as far as how various things exist. As concerns dukkha, I don't know what dukkha is like. As concerns laziness, I don't know what laziness is like. Questioning myself about laziness, there wasn't any. Questioning myself about dukkha, there wasn't any. The feeling inside my heart was exactly like this. I tried to recall and pin down that which is called dukkha. What is it? I really don't know. I only know how they discern the meaning in terms of conventional language because dukkha is just something created by common conventions. When the mind has no dukkha, all conventions whatsoever don't exist in the mind. And the experience of this feeling has lasted on continuously all the time since then. There has been no change all the way up to the present day. This same state still lasts on, and it has been stable, continuous, without changes. So that's obviously very awe-inspiring, and it does portray the possibility that we have um, as human beings to realize a profound peace, which isn't just psychological, you know, something very, very profound. Obviously, Lompo Liam is a very uh, um, adept um, and evolved human being, so this is an extraordinary statement. But if we just go back to that one sentence, seeing somebody, I just had the feeling of seeing it as absolutely normal. To see a person as simply a person, just that much. No beautiful persons, no ugly persons. People simply would be specifically they, the way they were. So what I wanted to talk about this e evening was the, this whole idea of attachment to opinions, attachment to views and opinions, and how how much suffering that creates both inwardly as, as individuals and in society. I guess all of us have had, probably we've all had um, experiences of maybe uh, working committees um, where someone has been very opinionated and where their opinions aren't the kind of sharing uh, of information or a sharing of ideas, they become uh, self-righteous, or they become domineering, or they become pompous. And I think all of us have suffered through that. Perhaps we've done it ourselves to others. But, but I know I've, I've, uh, I've probably done both. Uh, I've inflicted my opinions on people from an overly passionate place or an arrogant place. And people certainly have, I've received that kind of opinionatedness. And you see how much uh, con conflict and suffering there is in that, in that way of relating to humanity or other beings. Um, then we have we have ways of opinions and views that are that are based on uh, comparing ourselves to others. So I say to myself, "You are better than me. Um, I'm I'm better than you. We're equal." And these are these are valid comparisons. I could let's say if I if I were 
I think you pair my voice now with one of the junior monks' voices, I would say that the junior monks' voice is better than mine. So that's conventional reality. But when it becomes attachment is when it has a strong sense of self-view. And this we call Sakaya Ditti, a personality view. And in the West, sometimes we call that ego view, although the word ego is used in many ways. And personality view was, was uh, one of the things that the Buddha asked us to really uh, see as an object rather than as a fixed, permanent kind of subject. So if I, um, if I think that I'm, I'm, I'm better than you or I'm inferior to you, and I just see that as a perception that comes through consciousness, and I stay with the stillness of awareness, then I don't get stuck by it. I'm not attached to it. But if I, if I truly believe that you are inferior or I'm inferior, then I'm stuck in a kind of relationship to you, and I'm stuck in duality, I'm stuck in ego, I'm stuck in self. And that's suffering. That will always be suffering. Um, think about like views and opinions in terms of... of um, biases, say racial biases. Maybe uh, I've come through a culture that's racially biased to uh, another uh, type of person, their color of skin, their religion, whatever it is. And as soon as I see that person, because of my cultural or family biases and conditioning, as soon as I per see that person, I already have an opinion. That person is bad because they are such and such, or that person is, is gifted because they're such and such. I don't really know, but I have an opinion. I have formed an opinion. Lompaliam, the way he's saying um, uh, a person is just a person. And to actually observe someone, not as a man or a woman or uh, young or old or monk, like, like a lot of people uh, with, with, uh, project onto monks all, all manner of enlightened possibilities. We're just human beings, really. You know, we're just doing our best to, to practice the teaching. So sometimes people will project onto us um, uh, fantastic things, and then if we don't perform according to their, their fantastic expectations, then they'll say, oh, you disappointed me. But really, no one disappointed anyone. It was just a, a, a wrong expectation. So we have, we, have, we have intelligence, and we have the capacity to form views and opinions, and that's a good thing. I, I need to judge uh, various things in life to make decisions. There's nothing wrong with that. But when when do views and opinions become uh, suffering? That would be the question. Uh, in the, in the Metta Sutta, many of you probably do that chant. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. You know that chant, I think many of you. In the, the last lines are, um, by not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one having clarity of vision is not born again into this world. By not holding to fixed views. So you find this throughout, throughout the teachings of the Buddha. And, 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 and the thing here is to begin to really see thought as thought and see it as an object rather than the tendency to attach to thinking in all kinds of ways, in all kinds of ways which cause suffering. And where attachment, I would say, really is indicative is when there's a strong sense of self, right? Personality view or ego. And, and let's say... Let, let, let's say someone, um, like in, 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 a Buddhist, in a Buddhist viewpoint, killing is bad karma. We all agree to that for Buddhists. And then maybe someone comes to me and he says, well, uh, I want to I shoot animals because I eat them. And that, that's better than buying animals. So I shoot, I shoot animals, I kill animals, and I don't think that's wrong. Now, if I... I might have an opinion, well, there's going to be some kind of karmic result for your mind. I might have that opinion, but if I hold to it, and then I suffer because you're wrong, and I'm right, and you shouldn't do that, and I'm right, I don't care what you say, and I get into an argument, and I become self-righteous, I'm, I'm, I'm a holy monk, I don't kill animals. And that's all attachment. I can disagree with the person, can't I? I can say... Um, I, I disagree with you, but it does, I don't have to fight or struggle. I can just, well, I disagree with you, fine. What's wrong with that? And, you, and, and, and in the world now, you see so much kind of polarization, like in, in, um, in politics, say, um, the, the inability to compromise, where, where one side will have one view and another side will have another view, and the views will become more and more and more uh, alienating. If you hold that view, you must be absolutely 
evil. If you hold that, you, you must be absolutely stupid. And so there's more and more uh, hatred arising from that kind of polarity uh, of views and conceits. So what is the, the, um, the remedy to all this is to not become unintelligent. It doesn't mean that you don't have views or opinions, but you actually moderate them, I would say, with compassion. Because what is it about a viewpoint that is oppressive to you, to me? When I feel oppressed by a viewpoint, if someone, I feel like I'm being waterboarded. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like someone is, is uh, uh, trying to convert me or trying to oppress me with their opinion. And, if it, and, and that very oppression is, is causing me suffering. Now, in the practice of, of metta bhavana, one of the things we can do is we can feel suffering inflicted on us by other people. We can say to ourselves, well, when someone oppresses me with their opinion, when someone tries to force me, or when someone is pompous or arrogant, and I feel that um, affliction from their um, tyranny, the tyranny of their minds and their views, and I feel that. I don't like that. That's suffering. I feel, I, I feel tension. I feel, I feel anger. I feel fear or whatever. And I can say to myself, I'm not going to do that. I refuse to oppress other beings with my views and opinions. And that's not saying that I don't have views and opinions, but I begin to move to a way of compassion rather than being opinionated and being uh, divisive or tyrannical or whatever. That's a kind of a strength, isn't it, when, when, when I can do that. And much of, <coughs> a lot of the development of the heart can be, um, uh, you can cultivate the heart a lot with that, that, that particular uh, way of thinking. When I, when I see something that hurts me or I see someone else hurting someone else in some kind of way, I say to myself, hmm, I do that sometimes too. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go that way. And, it, and if I do that, then in this case, like if my opinions are oppressive or they are uh, in, insensitive or intolerant or I lack the quality to listen to others, uh, then, then I'll be more aware of that tendency to oppress someone. And then as I'm aware, more aware of that tendency to oppress someone, I'll be more in contact with them. As I'm more in contact with them, I'll have better communication, and whatever differences we have in views and opinions, we'll probably come to a better solution. But even if we disagree, even if we disagree and we, and we, and we walk away saying, well, I choose to disagree with you, then I don't have to carry it around with resentment and gossip and hatred and all the kind of burning feelings we have when we get into these very, very strong human arguments, these kind of strong polarities. And nowadays there's so, there's so much information that comes around through the internet and people have opinions about global warming, about racism, now about COVID. You know, when I see people have strong opinions about what the government should do or whatever, and I see that they're, they're not a scientist, they're not an epidemiologist, you know, they're, they're just, they've just read something if they've taken that position and then they become very self-righteous in that position. You think, well, what do you know? Where are you coming from? Uh, and why do you do that? And that's just a bad habit very often. Now, I can, I can counter that person and say, well, well, I disagree with you or it's too early to tell or whatever, but I don't have to argue. And that's one of the ways we suffer is when someone has a strong opinion and, and we hear that, we think we have to correct them all the time. Yes, sometimes you have to correct them. If someone is coming at you with an opinion which is just so cruel and so, so uh, un, un, untrustworthy or that by not saying something, you would feel like you are adding to their delusion or you would be kind of... In, complacent in that, sure, then you have to say strong things. No, I don't think that's right. That's wrong. You shouldn't do that. That's fine. That's strength and so on. But just the egotistical argumentation that we have as human beings, the need to always maybe uh, correct someone all the time or fix what they say or make them come to my viewpoint is a, is a kind of um, suffering both for others and ourselves. 
one of the things about Lumpur Liam, if you, many of you have had a chance perhaps to be with him, um, that he, he doesn't take positions. He's really beautiful. He's just he's there. And if you ask him, he'll, you know, he'll, he's, he's a very intelligent man. But you can see he's free of needing to have positions about this or that. As livelihoods and as, as adults, we need to have positions. We need to, to understand life. Like with the COVID infection now, we need to take on the public health measures and, and act accordingly. But to, to really free the mind, what we need to learn to do is we need to learn to come to the silence of the mind, the stillness of the mind. And the stillness of the mind does require the capacity to let go of thinking. Now, thinking is, is a natural thing. But, but it becomes the dominant factor in most of our lives. Intelligence, thought, views and opinions, uh, and then all the emotional things which can be um, held by thinking. Fears and, and worries and concerns, biases and prejudices and so on. So like, let's say if you have a perception of someone being uh, not a good person, Okay, so you're careful about that person, but to always hold that opinion, not a good person, not a good person, not a good person, you don't see the, the totality of their life, that there are good parts and bad parts, and you become someone, I become someone, uh, in definition of them, because I am the person that is judging them. Judgment is fine, but judgment with its held creates a strong sense of self, sakayaditi. So in the practices of, of non-attachment, what we're... What we're trying to do is we're actually trying to see an opinion as an object in mind, a thought as an object, not, not rejecting it. Let's say if I, have a, if I have a judgment about someone being inadequate. Now, the idealistic part of me might say, well, Lompo Liam doesn't have any opinions and judgments, therefore I shouldn't. So I have a judgment, that person is foolish, oh, I shouldn't be that way. That's another opinion. That's another complexity around that. But if I see that, okay, this is a judgment, and I use Ajahn Chah's language, it's uncertain. No, I'm not rejecting it. I say, well, that's a, that's a perception that's come up. It's uncertain. Then I'm with the person as they are. And if I see they're immoral or they're uh, corrupt or dishonest, I say, mm, okay. And I can walk away from that. I can go away from that. Or I can be with that, whatever, whatever is necessary. But quite often we'll just hold opinions about a person because of some interaction, some gossip that people have told us, some racial bias. So now all the, all the um, uh, social uh, demonstrations now about racism in, in the United States and Britain and so on, Canada, um, these are very significant things, um, very hurtful things that, that, that we have learned. Now how, how, can, how can a society say, move into a more compassionate and um, kind way. Well, one, one of the ways we can do that is through social institutions. But social institutions really depend on people. So the, the idea of Buddhism is that whatever way we're engaged in the betterment of our society, in the betterment of our environment, in the betterment of our families and ourselves, um, the, the most important thing is actually your own mind. Because if your own mind has wisdom and has a sense of strength and confidence, your own heart has a sense of openness, then you can be incredibly effective and not get burnt out. You can offer all kinds of things. But if you make the external the, the re most important and you ignore the inner, then you'll never succeed because your inner will be destroyed. So like let's say as a monk, I didn't ordain to be a monk. I ordained to liberate my heart. And it didn't, I didn't come into this to get a nice brown robe uh, and a haircut. <laughs> that wasn't the point, the point of it. The point of it was to give up to something within which I could watch my heart and learn about myself. The same with um, uh, family life, being a parent or, uh, or vocation, being a doctor or, or being unemployed, whatever you have. Those are the external realities that we live through. But the most important thing is the vocation of the heart, not the external vocation. So let's say one of the things I, I kind of understand now about myself is when I, when it came to, when I went to university, I, I entered into engineering at the University of Toronto, but I could not do it 
because I had no idea about my inner world. I was very confused, but very hungry. I wanted to understand, but I didn't have, had no idea how to understand my inner world. And so I could not be an engineer. Now, I could, but I won't. <laughs> I understand now how I could use of the vocation of engineering as a vehicle to understand my own mind, the conflicts I have with people or, or whatever it might be, or the development of skills. But then I couldn't do that. And I think this must be very difficult for people who get into like family life who have no real understanding of Dhamma, right? To actually cultivate the heart, to see that, that in, 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 in spiritual life there are usually three modes of, of, of understanding. There's monastic vocation, there's um, professional vocation, there's family vocation. And family is, is a vehicle for self-understanding. And you can see that if family is just about having successful children or successful career or whatever, and the inner world is ignored, can't be successful, can it? And that inner misunderstanding, that inner ignorance will then pollute everything. But if the very conflicts of family life or the conflicts of business life become a vehicle for understanding conflict. So going back to views and opinions, if I then am in a, in a committee meeting or in a family setting and there is someone who's very obnoxious, very maybe uh, racist or something like that in that situation, how can I use that situation both to be socially responsible but also to liberate the heart. I want to do both, don't I? I don't want to just have an argument with this uh, uncle of mine who's racist or, or, or whatever. Then I just have an argument. Each time I meet the uncle, I have the, uh, the uncle, the uncle, <laughs> Monkle, uncle, sorry. Uh, each time I meet the uncle, um, I have an argument with him. And then, you know, every Christmas or Songkran or whenever, Chinese New Year, I have the same argument with him. I've never resolved anything. He's an idiot, and I'm right. And he thinks the same thing about me. And that family life can be that way. But if I say, okay, this particular fellow in, in my, is a part of my life, is a part of my family, and family harmony is important, how can I be in that situation and both disagree with him, but not get burned by my disagreement, not carried around for the next half year and say, I'll never talk to him again, well, I have to use it as my practice. So uh, this particular uncle um, is my practice, isn't it? It's not that he's bad. He is the way he is. Like Uncle Liam says, he is the way he is. And I'm not going to agree with him because I think what he's saying is cruel and wrong. But what, how can my heart now realize freedom within this oppressive situation? And how can you do that? Well, you can only learn in the situation. You can walk away from the situation and say, so, well, I'm never going to get angry at that uncle again. You will get angry at that uncle again because you're programmed for that, right? But if you say to yourself, next time we're together, uh, I'm going to try to notice my heart rather than my head. I'm going to notice the tension and the aversion and, and how I want to punch him in the face every time he speaks or whatever. I'm going to actually witness that. Then I begin to have the mindfulness or awareness and the stillness which can watch the reactions that I'm getting and not react. Watch the impulses and not react. And as I not react, actually, I usually say much more skillful things because I'm coming from a place of, of power, actually. I'm coming from a place of strength. He might not hear it, but I'm coming from a place of strength. And that's a, that's a very real practice, whether it's monastic life or family life, these, these conflicts that we have as human beings when when strong positions are held, are terribly destructive, aren't they? Terribly destructive. And they linger in our minds, even though the person's not there. You might be, uh, I might be like this particular uncle that I have. Maybe I'll be worried about seeing him two months before I see him. I'll start thinking, no, I don't want to see him. I'm not going to go. Yes, I will go. I don't want to go. I don't want to. And the mind can just be obsessed and worried. But if you then say the practice is this uncle, that is the practice. That is the vocation. Being with this particular monk who I don't get along with, or my uncle, or my own body, which has now got some sickness I have to be with. That is the practice. So if I have cancer, cancer is the practice. I could practice if I didn't have cancer. I could practice if I didn't have this monk. I could practice if I didn't have this uncle. No, no. no it doesn't work that way. It works with what you've got. 
And as you, as, you, as, you, as you keep realizing that, you realize you can't really figure this out with thought. Thought can't figure it out. You figure it out more with, with uh, open awareness, with receptivity, and more and more kindness, more and more kindness to the whole situation. And I think we all begin to see that kindness isn't just an emotional, um, a type of emotion is deeper than that. Kindness or non-aversion is something which is the receptive part of our mind. We have the critical, judgmental part of our, our consciousness, so the, the, that place in, in the mind which makes judgments, that place in the mind which, which sees cause and effect, says, no, don't go right, go left, which makes judgments. The plumber is terrible, and they're going to use that plumber again. There's that part which, which analyzes and, and divides and criticizes. Good, try to use that. But also there's a part of our heart which knows that everything is as it is, that, that the, the capacity I have is to know it all, whatever it's beautiful or ugly or good or bad. And that is what we mean by the, 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 the openness of awareness, the open-hearted awareness, which is not, which knows judgment. Like I can, I can feel a very, um, I can be very judgmental about someone, but something in my mind is bigger than that judgment, isn't it? There's something bigger, which is awareness. So awareness has this kind of spacious, uh, uh, accepting quality, doesn't it? It accepts the fact that there is a judgment going on. It doesn't try to get rid of it. And as I know that, I see that that open-hearted, spacious awareness is peace itself. It's silence. It doesn't need anything. It doesn't need my uncle to agree with me or disagree with me. But when the uncle says something which is very cruel and caustic, I also have an emotional body, right? So it hurts. It hurts to feel someone being very insulting or, or, or rude or aggressive. It really hurts. So sure, I have social boundaries and I have feel and so on, but part of life is to, like to receive the, the, the swings and arrows of, of outrageous fortune, to, to be impinged by difficult things, but to hold your center. To hold your center. Okay, someone says to me which something which is insulting to my viewpoint of life. And my, and my viewpoint of life could be very compassionate and true. But it is insulting to that. And then I feel that. And, and I hold my center and I'm with the feeling, I'm with the feeling, and the feeling doesn't gain strength. And it ceases, and then I'm in a capacity, then I have a capacity to say things really wisely and strongly. I've certainly found that in the, the kind of meeting cultures I've had, when I've had in, in situations of large meetings, where quite often the person who can hear everything and receive everything then says something into the room from that sense of coolness. They have tremendous power, tremendous respect, even though they would have heard maybe something uh, caustic or aggressive or, or whatever. Now sometimes there's a power imbalance. Sometimes you, you, you can't say anything because the person who is aggressive or, or whatever just has more power than you. Then you have to still do the same practice. You can't maybe say anything. You can quit. You can walk away. Maybe you can't. But then you have to just witness. So this is, this is frustration. This is the inability to say anything. And awareness can be with that too. So the more we see that our vocation is awareness of change, and, and the more we develop that openness of awareness, then we can have views and opinions but that's not the be-all and end-all, because our refuge is no longer in views and opinions, in thought. It's something deeper. It's in that stillness of awareness. And I tried to indicate that just through the, the simple meditations that we start. I said, listen to sound, and then change the sense of object to your hands. And when you do that, you see that awareness contains both, and yet is neither. So it's like, like a vessel or a container which allows things to things come and go within that. Now, if you, if you see, if you begin to understand that and apply that to thought, apply that to emotion, that the, that the thinking mind, which is often driven by emotion, is just an object, and behind it is the silence of witnessing, then you're not caught in trying to get rid of it or change it. And that's very often the most destructive part of views and opinions, is our own self-disparagement. Quite often we are very idealistic, and we want to be good people, and, and we understand the, the, the beauty of goodness and so on, but sometimes the habits of mind are cruel 
or jealous or, 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 or divisive. And then the opinionated mind says you shouldn't be that way. But that's another opinion. So morally, we have restraints and we activate that which is compassionate for the goodness of others. But in awareness, as Lopez Semedo often says, it all, it all is natural. The most, you know, the most horrible kind of thought of cruelty is in nature. I don't like it. I don't condone it, but it's natural. And the most beatific thought is also natural. So when we talk about Dhamma or knowing Dhamma, we're talking about knowing nature. But when we talk about sila and, and, and lifestyle and, and uh, social responsibility, we're talking about the convention that we live in. So I might have a very cruel thought to hurt someone. I can know that, but I don't act on it. I don't speak on it. I don't think on it. I might think it through, but no, that's not the way to go. So the, 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 the refuge in awareness becomes more and more strong, even in the midst of difficulties. In fact, that's where you really get your strength, don't you? Where you, you can be aware through friction, through disappointment, you know, disappointment, friction, family friction, all those different kinds of things. Oh, like, like I know for myself, as I was the, the youngest of the family, I, had a, I have one brother, and I often felt like I had to um, uh, solve the frictions, you know, soothe everyone. Not that we had a bad family, just normal family. So I was, didn't like, I didn't like conflict. I don't like conflict, right? So, so I found that that same habit then came into monastic life. And so whenever there's a conflict, I felt I had to fix it. But it fixed itself. I didn't have to fix it all, but that was a habit of mine. I felt uncomfortable with conflict. And so then I had to learn, oh, oh, this is just conflict in the monastery. And it's never bad. It's just human beings, right? But then I, as I began to see that, oh, conflict goes this way, then I didn't become the person who had to fix the conflict. But my opinion before that was driven by all the kind of childhood conditioning I had. So as soon as a, a conflict came up, I had to fix it. I became the person who had to fix which didn't deny the fact that I could sometimes help to create harmony, but it was, wasn't later on. Now it's not driven by this personality, by ego, by need. So we find freedom within the noticing of these very kinds of habits, the forming of views and opinions, the forming of self-view, self-view and other view. And the more we witness to that and don't believe it, the more we find the kind of deep, deep silence of the heart. And then Lompoliam's statement then becomes um, very, very interesting. And I find that, I've, I've come back to that, seeing somebody, I just had the feeling of seeing it as absolutely normal. To see a person as simply a person, just that much. No beautiful persons, no ugly persons. People simply would be specifically the way they were. This is the kind of peace and tranquility that arose. All right? So that's some thoughts that I've been pondering over the last week. Thank you, Lok Po. Uh, let's all say three sadhus together. Han damayam o vada damagathayo sadhu karam kadama se sadhu 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 anumodami yeah, be well. Blessings from all of us. Stay safe. See you next time.